Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, having sat through the two sessions previously, I'm slightly humbled to be uh, stood up here on this stage, uh, but I'll, I'll do my best to relay this to you as best I can. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, emerging technologies, including artificial intelligence, and some of the work that we're doing at Oracle with uh, a charity called the World Bee, um, uh, the World Bee Project, hence the picture of the two bees behind me. Okay. Um, to, to just sort of set the scene, um, I'm just going to talk about, this is the kind of question I stupidly agreed to try and uh, answer, but um, to set the scene, I just want to try and say, well, why are we trying to do anything? And I, I guess it's stating the obvious a little bit, but the way I sometimes try and think about this is, if you think about a stone, a stone on its own doesn't do very much. If it's standing still, it might gather moss. If it's rolling, it might write the odd, write the odd decent tune. Um, but other than that, it doesn't affirm much purpose. But if you put it into a, a particular part of a structure, it starts to take a, a much more key role, and it becomes what's known as a keystone. And if you look at the, uh, the definition of a keystone, it, you get words like you know, locking the whole thing together or on which all depends. So if you take that down and go back to bees, um, it's linking that uh, while this a stone becomes a keystone, a bee is what's known as a keystone species. And what bees and other pollinators do is a keystone process. Uh, to put that process and the uh, importance of it in context, I've just got some, some numbers here. First thing to realize is if you're just thinking about bees as being either bumblebees or honeybees, there are actually 20,000 species of bees. There are more species of bees than there are birds. Um, uh, and the honeybee is only one subspecies of that. 77% of all food, so two mouthfuls in every three mouthfuls of food we eat depends on pollinators. And to put the importance of the honeybee in context, about half of that, so a third of all food, gets pollinated by bees. So they're, they're a pretty important species uh, and therefore very you know, key. Um, that equates to something around 577 billion. There's a range there in terms of a global annual um, uh, food industry based on pollinated foods with 1.5 billion jobs depending on that industry as well. Um, and the other really sort of significant figure there is the 87%, which is 87% of all plants depend on pollinators. So it's not just food. <laughs> Um, if we didn't have pollinators, we wouldn't have food, but we also potentially wouldn't have oxygen uh, with plants using photosynthesis and turning carbon dioxide to oxygen. So they're really important, but there is an issue, as you can see, almost every day in the, in the newspapers um, with the decline in insects and the decline in species and the decline in pollinators in particular. Um, these are from a, a United Nations report back in 2016, I think, so these will have changed and not all areas are tracked. Um, but in the EU, 25%, there was a 25% decline in honeybees in, in 20 years, 40% uh, decline in, in honeybees in the US in something like 10 years, and really frighteningly, a 45% decline in the UK since 2010. So that was probably about seven or eight years or something like that. Um, so that, there is a problem. Whether those, whether those figures are exactly accurate now or not, I think is that there's an accepted problem that there is a decline. Uh, and much of the reasons for that are known. So the reasons are known around potential overuse, over-intensified farming methods between uh, disease uh, for bee health um, and different land management, et cetera. But not everything's known. And one of, the, one of the things that came out of that 2016 report was that there was a lack of data, of data, underlying data, to support sort of further research into it. And this is why Sabir Malik is the founder of the World Bee Project, founded her community interest company, the charity. Um, uh, to, to look into the reason why. And she wanted to underpin that with science, and then she wanted to support it with technology, which is when she came to Oracle and we started to get involved. And the way that Sabir looks at it is um, she looks at the whole thing as being everything connected. So it's not just about the bees, and it's not about climate change, and all, it's about everything being connected. And she has this sort of vicious circle that, that she thinks of in her mind about the decline. Um, and when I think about where, she, where you start on this circle, I'm sort of reminded of that joke of someone asking someone, can you tell me where, the way to the town hall? And they say, well, yes, but I wouldn't start from here. Um, but the, 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 the point where she starts is with the bee decline. Now, something obviously causes that, but if you start with the decline in the, in the bee pollinators, what that can lead to is then a decline in gene, um, genetic variability, which can then lead to a further decline in biodiversity which then puts more pressure on people using more intensive farming methods, which change land use, which then has a knock-on to the climate, which then has a further knock-on to a uh, decline in, in pollinators. So she's got this sort of picture in her mind, and she's got a way of... Her goal is to transfer that into a more positive circle, which I'll come to at the end, um, which I guess is the big, bold prediction bit. Um, 
Anyway, so, so where, where does um, technology come into it? Well, so the, the key bit underlying this in terms of getting more technology to support what we want to do is the idea of trying to support the Wilbury project to establish what she calls a global hive network, which essentially um, involves putting sensors on beehives uh, in multiple areas around the world. These two on the left, as you're looking, are um, our two hives where we've just been doing most of our sort of test work in Reading outside the offices in Thames Valley Park. And you can see they're sort of set on weight scales and there's a number of different cables and sensors tracking things like temperature, humidity, and also noise, which I'll come back to in a minute as well, about the acoustic, the noise that the bees make. Because you can tell a lot about the behavior of the bees and the health of colonies through the hum that they're making as well. Um, and what you see on the, on the right as you look here is just fairly simplistic, just to show that there is kind of inherent value in that data immediately that comes off a single hive, that you could see that a beekeeper could see whether their hive was functioning healthily. Uh, the green line there is uh, the, the weight of the hive, um, and this is a period last October, so almost a year ago when we first sort of put these sensors on that particular hive. And you can see at the beginning of October when there's those last flowering, um, probably ivy in, in, in the UK, uh, flowers there. The bees are going out foraging and you can see the weight going up and then just going down as the moisture is fanned off overnight. Um, but then as you get towards the end of October, you can see it just going down because there's nothing more for the bees to forage on. It's a massive leap where the beekeeper is probably putting some extra food in or something. Um, and then the other thing that's overlaying it is temperature, going up to the day, down to the night, outside. Now that's just an example, just to show that a beekeeper can see inherent value. But where, where we hope to bring value, and we're not there yet, because this is going to take a long time to build up, but is if you imagine having thousands of hives in lots of different regions of the world with that data coming in and being able to overlay that with other information about pollution or land management or, or whatever, then you could start to use the real power of sort of machine learning and AI to look for those patterns and try and see associations of the data with bee health in that particular region. Does that make sense? So that's where, the way we're sort of heading. To sort of touch on some of the areas, not going to spend too much on this, but I think this is critical because uh, what, one of the things about you, it's all about capturing that data, but it's about getting that information and getting those insights out to people. And what, what, according to Sabia, what we're finding is that even in the poorest regions of the world, there is still a real prevalence in mobile technology in terms of, so not everyone will necessarily have a computer and browsers, but being able to get the information of their hives and any new insights or information, and also capture information when you're um, inspecting your hive through a mobile device is pretty key. So we've worked in that area through things like mobile, but also digital assistants and chatbots, which I'll come back to again in a second. Um, and when we were sort of demonstrating this just in, in different events, we found beekeepers were coming up and saying, you know what would be really useful for this is when we're inspecting our hives, and they depend very heavily on, every, you know, however often looking at the hive and recording what they're seeing there, they're suited and booted like this, and they don't want to have a flip chart, uh, or they don't even really want to be holding devices. So we've developed a, a chatbot, uh, an audio chatbot uh, through a microphone, um, and we're just testing it out. This guy is the uh, beekeeper, head beekeeper at Chelsea Physic Garden in London. Uh, using it and testing it out in pilot phase at the moment to, to do that and record the data and potentially analyze it and share it. So another area linking to food security is if you start to think about pollinated foods or honey. Honey, I didn't realize it's such a huge industry. It's a seven, seven billion plus industry um, growing still and many communities and even in poorest areas will depend very heavily on it. But it's also one of the most adulterated um, food substances out there. I think in the US it was found to be the third most adulterated food produce behind milk and olive oil. Olive oil is the, the most adulterated one. So we've done a bit of work. I mean, really what we're trying to do here is to support the Wilbury project to establish what they want to establish is this B mark, this sort of eco label that you could have on food to show the provenance of where the foods come from. The work we've been doing is very experimental at the moment, but in order to, you can take honey as a very unique signature based on what the bees have been foraging on at that particular time. And you can look at that um, under a microscope and you can identify where that pollen came from. So you can see whether that makes sense that it came from that region. So Japanese maple is the top one there. There isn't gonna be much of that in Reading, okay? But actually what's probably more interesting is just finding whether it's been watered down with sugar solution. Or even what we're, what we're thinking is whatever it's got in it at the point when it comes off the hive, and then you sample from the same batch further down the supply chain, has it changed? And so there's a kind of a use for something like blockchain in there to securely store that evidence between parties who don't necessarily uh, trust each other. Yeah, okay. 
So we've done some work with that based on pollen, but it's also probably more likely, if you're talking about an apple or a pear, um, that you're not going to take a sample of the actual product itself. But what you can do is to monitor the way that the land is being um, farmed. And you can do that by seeing whether it's got wildfire strips, and you can do that with aerial photography, either through satellite imagery or drone photography, and, and uh, then using data science to actually continually monitor that to see whether it's biodiverse or mono, just a monoculture farm, farming. And again, that evidence could be stored in blockchain. So I'm not quite sure what this person's doing with the finger. Apparently, it's entirely safe because they're full of honey at that point and quite docile. But this is then looking into the area of swarming. So a bee swarm is a, is a perfectly natural thing that honeybees do when they run out of space. So two thirds of them will up and go and find somewhere else to live with their existing queen and find somewhere else to live. Not a problem, perfectly natural. They go and form this kind of beard-like thing on a tree while they decide where they're going to go. There's a long story behind it. Um, not a problem, except if you're a commercial beekeeper, you've just lost two-thirds of your bees. Um, so I mentioned earlier about the gathering of the acoustic data, and this is not work we've undertaken, so I'm not claiming that, but we've just, we're have just using it in the technology and trying to look at how we can then monitor that and look for, for signals to, to send alerts. But what you find from the acoustic and the noise the bees make is that up to 21 days before the beehive is about to swarm, this is frequency along the bottom and decibels at the top. And the one on the, your left is, is a group of hives um, as they're getting closing to swarm. And you can see around 250 hertz. You can suddenly see it starting to peak. So we can track that, and we put it through stream analytics and then spot it when it starts to raise and to start to say they might be swarming. OK, go and look. <laughs> no, they're definitely swarming. If I were you, I'd go and do something about it. OK? Um, it's difficult because it's about getting that quality of acoustic data still off a hive, wherever the hive is and everything. So again, it's work in progress, but the technology, it is possible to do it. Um, uh, we're just sort of working on the detail. Um, the other area we've sort of toyed with, and again, this is probably impractical, but is the idea as well that you can do another reason for the decline is predators. So this is, an Asian, this is a hive being attacked by two Asian hornets. So again, what we did was we took images uh, took a high-definition video, and you were able to spot, you can just about see the big squares spotting that those are bees and the, big, the small squares are hornets. Again, in practice, you can imagine that in the middle of Kenya, you're not going to have high-definition cameras on a hive, and you might be more likely to spot that through um, the acoustic, the noise that the hornets are making instead, which would be cheaper if you've got the microphone on anyway. But it just, we've been doing this kind of work just to spark ideas, really, and maybe in the future, who knows, maybe, maybe it all becomes cheaper and we will be able to do it. Um, but these things are a big problem. I saw someone in an event in Spain whose family has 50 hives and half of them every year are wiped out by Asian hornets. So it's, it's a significant problem. So it's kind of a real whirlwind. I can talk about this. I've, in the year I've been working on this, I knew nothing about bees about a year ago, and I'm kind of a bit of a bee geek. So uh, there's lots of... It's very interesting, for example, the reason why they, they make that noise when they change the swarm. I haven't got time to tell you now, but if you want to catch me afterwards, I'll tell you, because it's quite an amusing story. Um, but I guess I want to just finish in the last sort of couple of minutes in terms of coming back to the starting point and saying that, you know, I, I remember presenting this earlier in the year at an IoT meetup or something, and someone put a comment afterwards about, oh, Oracle's application is never going to save the world or something, which is a bit, a bit, a bit harsh, I thought. And we're not pretending to. I think, you know, Sabir believes that the only answer, there is an alternative solution, but it's only going to come from strong collaboration from lots of different organizations, including other large technology corporations like Oracle as well, and us all kind of working together. And it kind of links back to the session I was listening to earlier as well, because if I'm going for my kind of big, bold um, uh, hope, <laughs> shall I say, or prediction, I think you know, there was this talk about whether technology can inform policymakers and governments, because it does need governments. And governments elsewhere in the world, in India and in Africa, are looking to invest in this quite heavily, because they know their livelihoods are that people's livelihoods are based on it. But actually, changing policymaker across the world is going to be quite hard. So my, my bolder hope and prediction is that actually through, hopefully, what you've seen here is that what the technology, emerging technology and AI can do is to give information more from the bottom up and give that helpful information to people whose livelihoods depend on the pollination and get that information out there and hopefully it has effect higher up as well. So to close, I'll close on the... Um, I guess Sabia's vicious circle, I'll go back to the, the positive side of that, um, which is where, where she really, really hopes to get to is where you, um, I've forgotten the name of it now, 
Um, but it's, it's where, where the sustainable farming, and there's a word, EI, I've forgotten what it is, but um, ecological intensive farming, that's the word, the phrasing. And she wants to really encourage and give people the information to be able to do that. And if they're able to do that, what that does is improve diversity, biodiversity of the land, which improves bee health, which increases yield. And that's known that it increases yield if you use pollinators to do it. And from doing that, you, include, you improve uh, livelihoods of the farmers, which in turn, you know, makes them use more ecologically intense farming. So that's the kind of the positive circle that she's hoping to go to. And I guess my bold prediction will be that through the collaboration of all these different people and the use of emerging technology, that, that we'll get there. Thank you very much.